It's my um, pleasure now to try and do, as Carlos said, to uh, synthesize, I think, four pretty uh, exciting, provocative, and extremely information-rich uh, presentations that we had this morning, and I've got 30 minutes to do it in. So I'll apologize now to the four speakers, because I'm going to probably make a complete travesty in many ways of what you said. But I thought what I'd try and do is uh, project what I thought uh, were the things that came out to me rather than try and summarise. I'm probably spend 30 minutes just summarising your presentation, your own, just on your own, um, given the, the density of your slides and so on. Um, but just what came out of, for me, what kind of hit me in terms of ideas. And I've used a few images in all of this as well because uh, I'm just beginning to get the hang of putting photographs into, into PowerPoint on a great expert. So I thought I'd sort of, you know, use that new talent uh, just for today and run it by you. Um, so, um, first one was, uh, was Joran. Um, very uh, densely packed presentation, Joran, I think. Um, and I think, you know, clearly the main focus of your uh, talk to us this morning was about uh, productivity and the importance of STEM in that and what we need to do to increase productivity uh, in Australian manufacturing. And I think one of the things that came out for me, and this I think will came out in most of the presentations actually, was the issue of competence of our managers. And I think that's been a really important theme, and I'll probably come back to that later on that's come out this morning, but it came up pretty early on, I think from what Joran was saying, that a lot of the key to this is in the competence and the training of our managers. And I think a question for us is, what does that mean? How do we train them? What do we do? What do we do to improve the skill sets of our, of our management and leadership that can make some of these other changes happen? Um, other things I think that came from uh, Joran for me were uh, you know, high performance work systems, that list of characteristics I think that you put up there and your very good point that one or two of these don't necessarily make much difference. What the research shows is they need to be implemented together. They're a complementary system particularly uh, of, um, in terms of skills training because if you look across that list actually that you and ha had there, there are a number of those characteristics that came across as key and one of those was the skills training. So I think again in terms of what we're talking about here, the future skills requirement for Australian manufacturing. Uh, skills training is really a constant if you're going into the high performance work systems area. Um, and the same thing around clusters as well and the, and the, the sort of co-location. If you ever come to Federation University, it's a great pleasure of coming to Federation University at Ballarat. When you drive in the front gate, the first thing you'll go through is not the university, but what we call our technology park, which is really a business park. And that is actually a clustering there of, uh, of small sort of startup uh, ICT uh, enterprises in our case. And I think that notion of being together, sharing the same space and the actual interaction between uh, the people who work in these small organisations has worked really well for us. Um, technology will drive the need for higher and broader skills. And that notion of higher and broader, I also want to come back to as to what we're actually, what we mean by that and whether this is a contradiction in terms of specialist versus broad skills for the future. Um, I think also you're and you get the phrase of the day um, for introducing us to the really interesting notion of industrial euthanasia um, amongst your many throwaway lines and as that, that came out I think puts in answer to one of the questions, great phrase, um, and how do we do that? Is this a form of industrial Darwinism that you're, um, you're advocating or not? And uh, what does that mean in terms of the present government's policies? The thing that I think came out for me most was something you only referred to in passing in your presentation, but actually comes out much more strongly in your paper. Uh, and that's this notion of servitization, the move in manufacturing away from simply a focus on the product and the thing that's produced more towards um, this here, this kind of um, notion that the product is something isn't necessarily unique to the firm, but if it's bundled up with a number of other things, a number of other services that go around that, uh, then you can achieve that uniqueness which provides the platform for the firm then to provide its own niche and to be highly productive in its own area. And, and again, this notion of servitization, the expansion, if you like, of manufacturing away from the traditional notion of producing a thing to rather something that is embedded in a collection of services. And other things, again, was, I think, uh, initially spelled out by you, but uh, put, uh, became, I think, quite an important part of other people's presentations as well. Um, after you... Um, 
So you might, this is my favourite photograph in the thing. Um, riding the waves of the mega change and the mega trends was a, a very uh, stimulating presentation from Swimac on some of CSIRO's um, future gazing uh, uh, around, uh, the, around the Australian economy and around Australian society in general, but obviously today talking about megatrends. Um, I don't need to go through all these. Uh, Swimac himself went through them. There is one particularly favourite one today, which, of course, is a favourite for me because it's actually my birthday today. Um, not a birthday I care to talk about, I have to say, but nevertheless, it is my birthday. And, uh, and so that notion of the forever young, I really identified with there, particularly in terms of having to work a lot longer. Uh, <laughs> I'm not thinking of retirement just yet. So I think, um, and that notion of demographic change, of course, is sweeping through the workforce and sweeping through it in a way that I think is quite interesting in terms of people's attitudes towards work, how long they will stay at work, and what that means for the firms and the organisations that employ them and their skills uh, and their skills uh, levels. In terms of um, uh, what uh, we got in terms of how what that means for manufacturing, I think um, again, and this links back into the servitisation notion, which was something I think that was built on by most of our speakers today. This notion of customisation of the move uh, from mass production you like to Toffler's idea of mass customization from 40 or 50 years ago, but I think is becoming very much a reality uh, to us all today. That notion of actually personalizing the product and personalizing the service, very clearly linked to that notion of manufacturing, not just in the future being about producing a thing and selling that thing to a mass market, but rather a product which is uniquely customized uh, to what uh, each of us want. Um, Again, I think the notion of high-performance work systems you mentioned, and again, that notion of the, a number of different factors that make up a high-performance workplace that have to work in conjunction with one another and have to be complementary with one another uh, to make sure that they produce what we need, and the higher and broader skills. And again, I think you put a lot of emphasis on the notion of management and managing this process and management capability. Again, a very strong theme coming through uh, your presentation as well as the others uh, today. Um, Sam led us um, into a very interesting discussion around design. Um, and I must admit, Sam, when I first read the paper in anticipation of today, I kind of just hadn't really thought around design in the way that you were explaining it. So I found that a very a provocative presentation in many ways about how we rethink the notion of design. And I like your idea of design not as a noun but as a verb, as something that we do, not something that we create. I couldn't resist this picture, however, um, which, of course, is the move from product innovation. Now, I've been around because it's my birthday long enough to remember TV sets like this. My I remember my parents buying one in the 50s and sitting down with one of those two knobs, turning it on and actually having only two channels. Uh, this was the UK in the late 1950s to, to choose between. Um, but a very stylish product in its time, and I'm sure that you would, Sam, agree. <laughs> a nice bit of design, actually. Um, but, of course, what you're talking about is a much broader notion of design and design and innovation, something I think a little bit more like this, which is the business model for Twitter, which I uh, discovered in moving around the internet over the last few days in preparation for this, quite an interesting uh, business model there. But I think the reason I want to put it up was I think that very much kind of highlights the premise of what Sam was saying around innovation and design, that this is something that is built through the process, not just about the service that Twitter gives, but the way in which it's researched, their, <coughs> their interaction with their customers, their suppliers, their partners, and so on. And I think uh, this is quite a good example, perhaps, of the sort of thing that you were trying to talk to us about, about that notion of embedding innovation and design-led mentality uh, in, in the enterprise uh, more generally. Um, in terms of what does it mean, what I heard uh, Sam telling us about Australian innovation, uh, we are an innovative nation, I think I heard him say, but we're innovative only in certain sorts of ways. We're very good at the, the kind of technical, perhaps, uh, R&D, the product-focused innovation, or we certainly have been in the past. Um, we're very good at that kind of notion of efficiency in what we do and promoting efficiency. Um, but I think uh, what, we're, what Sam's really talking about is embedding that that thinking around, if you like, the operational aspects of the business, much more in all the other uh, aspects of the business as well. 
And again, getting this notion of a design mindset, design-led mindset, uh, into, into managers in Australian uh, manufacturing is going to be very important. And so that notion, again, of, of that very strong uh, management skill set to be able to lead these, these changes in the way that people think inside our enterprises and the way in which we conceive of manufacturing into the future uh, is going to be very important. Uh, finally, coming to John's presentation, um, I didn't get the Braided River, John, but I did get the Mississippi Delta. This, uh, this is a, this is a uh, sort of satellite photograph of the Mississippi Delta, and I think kind of emphasises or illustrates the same point, uh, as it were, that you've not simply got one pool, and that to think of our skills pools and to think of, uh, of, of our people and our human capital as simply, a, as it were, a stagnant pool uh, is not a very helpful way of looking at what is now a very dynamic labour market. And I think, as I thought this was a really interesting image that you put together of a, not only a river, because a river flows and therefore changes all the time, but a river that is flowing constantly in different directions and has different branches, some of which come back on one another, others of which lead out but may come back into the labour market later on. And that, I think, notion of a kind of very dynamic uh, labour market with all sorts of different sorts of movements going on is a very interesting image to use for uh, our notion of what we mean by vocational training and vocational skill sets uh, into the future. Um, I think what John led us through was um, uh, an interesting look at where we'd come from and um, the, uh, in fact, the fact that um, manufacturing, although we tend to talk of it as a sector, is in fact a very, very varied sector indeed. Um, and if you look at the performance of manufacturing in Australia over recent years, uh, it's not true to say that it's always necessarily in decline. There are sectors in manufacturing that are clearly still quite strong and doing well. Others that are finding it very difficult and struggling. And so we have to think about the sector as a very kind of differentiated place. And I thought also interesting was your point about how, although we've had steep declines in manufacturing employment in this country, uh, there have actually been even steeper declines in some of the other developed countries in, in, in Europe as well, which I think is a, probably would be an interesting area to explore a little bit more. Um, I think also your uh, sort of notion about restructuring and the attempt back in the sort of late 80s and early 1990s through the award restructuring process to recreate or to create probably for the first time career paths for many workers who'd never had them. Uh, and the fact, you know, that was a time of great optimism, I remember, and uh, the rewriting of awards and the, the possibilities through more extensive training of offering uh, a lot more skills development to workers who'd never had that and the possibility of moving up. But in fact, uh, that when you come to look at what the impact of that has been 15 to 20 years later, it's been nothing like uh, what we would have hoped it to have been and a, probably a bit of a dead end in some ways in terms of that approach uh, to skills development. Um, I think, um, again, the vocational stream is an interesting notion. And the idea here of linking different occupations together into a kind of vocational set, if you like, uh, within which people tend to move around. And I think also linked into John's idea that this isn't necessarily, um, with all due respect to Oprah and the, um, and the, and the report they've just released, about the, about the manufacturing workforce. This is about the Australian workforce and what part the occupations that are prevalent in manufacturing play in the Australian workforce, and what part, if you like, the, the development of the workforce uh, has uh, in terms of um, generally uh, promoting uh, manufacturing as a sector and vice versa. So I'm not really necessarily thinking of manufacturing as this kind of isolated sector where we have a number of occupations that are unique to it, uh, because, of course, as John's figure showed, a lot of those occupations that we may have thought, like machine tool fitters and so on, are pretty unique to manufacturing. In fact, the bulk of those people are employed outside the manufacturing sector. So we have to think in terms of manufacturing as being part of um, a much bigger and more dynamic labour market, which is where, of course, uh, vocational education uh, is, uh, it plays its game. And again, I think coming from your talk, the notion of management capability and making this work within the firm is really down to management skill sets. So that's kind of my take on the, on the, on the four speakers that we have this morning. I think, as you can see, I can see a lot of complementarities, although very different in their approach, very different in the kind of points they were making, a lot of underlying similarities. Um, and I 
think probably for me, uh, the key underlying similarities are that notion of not thinking of manufacturing anymore so much as a product-centered thing, uh, but as, as, a, as a sector which produces, in the future, unique products which are surrounded by sets of services which make uh, those products unique and make them uh, the kind of products that people want to buy in this country and overseas. So that notion of servitization, of mass customization, if you like, is going to be really the key to the nature of the manufacturing sector into the future. The concept of innovation and design, not only in terms of the products we produce, uh, but also right across the organisation, the notion of non-technical innovation, which I think, uh, as Sam said, is not necessarily something that Australian businesses have been good at in the past, but we need to think uh, as much in terms of the innovation of our organisation as we do around the innovation of the product of the service that we're actually producing. As I said, management competence seems to me, in many respects, to be the glue in all of this. Without that, none of the things that we've been talking about can really take place. And I think a big challenge for the education system, the tertiary education system, which I guess I represent from a dual sector university, is, well, how do we do this? How do we train people? Is it the case, as you already said, that, you know, or I think uh, you said that, a, you know, an MBA isn't necessarily going to give you the tools that you need uh, or management education, I think it was Sam's point, isn't necessarily going to give you the tools that you need to become effective in this, if that's the case. And if we know that we have a task in front of us in terms of the development of management competence, how do we do that? How do we build that into our systems? How do we reform the educational process uh, that managers need to go through to get these skills? And I think the higher but broader skills presents us with some interesting uh, issues as well. And I know that you know, we're looking at the nature of training packages and what's going to happen to training packages in the future and the processes that it goes through. Training packages, in many respects, have been a great success for the Australian vet system over the last 20 years or so. But do they really address this issue of broad uh, competences? It's one thing to talk about specialisation and deepening skills and so on as the career path forward. But I think what most of our speakers have been saying this morning is in the future, it isn't necessarily going to be the specialist skills or the deepening of skills in a particularly narrow area that's going to be the key to most people's careers. It's going to be the development of those broader sets of skills. How do we package that into a training package system built around very highly specified uh, qualifications and, and what's the future for the VET system uh, if we're going to do that? So I think a great deal of commonality in the, in the, uh, in the talks that we saw this morning, very different emphases uh, coming from very different um, disciplinary backgrounds, but a lot of commonality and a lot of common questions, I think, uh, posed for, uh, for education and for Manufacturing Skills Australia. Okay, thanks very much.